Welcome to our channel. Today we'll show you a 1993 American epic historical drama film titled Schindler's List. The film follows Oskar Schindler seeking his fortune in the aftermath of the German invasion of Poland. He joined the Nazi party and took over a confiscated enamelware plant in occupied Krakow, making a quick fortune on the labor of his unpaid Jewish prisoners. Yet, as the Holocaust descended over Europe, Schindler risked everything to protect and rescue more than 1,100 Jews sheltered in his factory. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The film begins with an opening card saying, September 1939. The German forces defeated the Polish army in two weeks. Jews were ordered to register all family members and relocate to major cities. More than 10,000 Jews from the countryside arrive in Krakow daily. The first scene shows crowds of Jews from all over the country arriving in Krakow and submitting their names to German officials waiting on the station platforms. Later, a German Nazi party member and businessman Oskar Schindler enters a club. He observes the SS officers. When a high official comes in, Oscar gets generous by buying them drinks. By the end of the night, each Nazi soldier at the club knows his name. The following day, Oscar goes to a local Judoran, a Jewish council comprised of 24 elected Jews personally responsible for carrying out the orders of the regime in Krakow. And we see there's a lot of Jewish filing their complaints. Oscar heads to the main office and asks for Itzhak Stern. Later in the private room, Oscar tells him that he requires Jewish investors to help him purchase an enamelware factory. Oscar informs him that he can get the signatures. That's the easy part. Finding the money to buy the company, that's hard. Itzhak replies Jews can no longer own businesses. Oscar then says that's why this one's in receivership. But they wouldn't own it. I'd own it. He further says I'd pay them back in products, pots and pants. Something they can use. Something they can feel in their hands. They can trade it on the black market and do whatever they want. Still, Stern initially rejects the offer and tells him that he doesn't know anybody who'll be interested in this. The next day, Oscar proceeds to a church where Jewish smugglers meet in secret to do business. He asks one of the smugglers named Poldak that he will require many luxury products in the following months, which Poldak promises to obtain. In March of 1941, all Jews from Krakow and surrounding areas are forced from their homes and required to crowd into an area of only 16 square blocks called the ghetto. That's when Oscar arrives in his new apartment that he technically took over from a displaced Jew family. A few days pass and Oscar meets with the Jewish investors with the help of Itzhak Stern. Oscar tells them that for each 1,000 they invest, he will repay them with 200 kilos of enamelware a month to begin in July and to continue for one year. They say that it's not good enough. Oscar then says, look where you're living. Look where you've been put. Oscar points out that the concept of money would be useless now. He says trade goods, that's the only currency that'll be worth anything in a ghetto. Things have changed, my friend. Eventually, he gets money from Jewish investors who agree to accept Oscar's terms. Without any delay, he starts the factory. He hires Jews rather than Poles because they're less expensive to employ. Workers in Schindler's factory will be declared essential, which means that they wouldn't be deported to concentration camps. Stern uses his skills and quickly fills the factory with many Jewish workers. Many of those hired are not skilled in metalwork. But Stern makes sure that they're trained and doesn't affect production. Stern is actually saving his people. As days pass, Schindler becomes aware of what is going on and seems embarrassed by the whole arrangement but takes no action to stop it. Meanwhile, an SS officer named Amon Goth arrives in Krakow to initiate the construction of a labor camp, Plazo, and to take control over the ghetto. In one of the most sickening scenes in the film, a Jewish engineer explains that a foundation has been improperly laid. She tells Amon Goth that they have to restart the construction. The next moment, Amon Goth orders to execute her on the spot. He then, in the next breath, orders that everything she requested be done. When Plazo is finished, a brutal crackdown begins. Amon sends in hundreds of troops to clear the cramp rooms and shoots anyone who refuses or cannot leave. While the carnage is ongoing, Schindler and his lover observe the destruction from a perch high above the ghetto. He sees a tiny girl going amid the devastation in a red coat, the only color in the otherwise black and white scene. He also notices a group of Jew lined up and shot using a rifle. The remaining survivors are shot in the head. Schindler is clearly impacted by what he witnessed. The eradication and massacres continue into the night. Schindler now faces the more immediate problem of how to run his factory without his workers. He meets Amon Goth, befriends him, and convinces him to let him keep his workers for considerable bribes and payoffs. 
Schindler is now, though reluctantly, sheltering people who have very few skills in his factory. Later, a lavish party is thrown for Amengoth at his villa. As a few days pass, an order arrives from Berlin commanding Goth to exhume and destroy all bodies of those skilled in the Krakow ghetto. They ask to dismantle Pazzo and ship the remaining Jews to Auschwitz. Schindler then asks Goth to let him keep his workers so that he can move them to a factory in his old home in Moravia. Goth allows him to do that. Schindler and Stern assemble a list of workers. The list goes from 450 to 600 to 850. It cost Oscar more than millions of Reichsmark, the currency used in Nazi Germany. Soon, the people on the list are transported to Czechoslovakia on two separate trains, the men on one train and the women on the other. All the men on Schindler's list arrive safely at the new site, but the train carrying the women and the children is accidentally redirected to Auschwitz. There, the women are directed to what they believe is a gas chamber after a harrowing experience where their hair is cruelly cut off and they are forced to strip. They see only water falling from the showers. The day after, the women are shown waiting in line for work. In the meantime, Schindler rushed immediately to Auschwitz to solve the problem and to get the women out of Auschwitz. He bribes the camp commander, Rudolf Haas, with a cache of diamonds so that he's able to spare all the women and the children. However, the last problem arises just when all the women are boarding the train because several SS officers attempt to hold some children back and prevent them from leaving. Schindler steps in and successfully releases the children from the soldiers. Following the return of the women, Oscar strictly orders the guards from visiting the workshop without permission and bans summary executions. Schindler also permits the Jews to reserve the Sabbath and spends much of his fortune acquired in Poland bribing Nazi officials. In his hometown, he surprises his wife while she's in church during Mass and tells her that she's the only woman in his life. She goes with him to the factory to assist him. As soon as Germany surrendered and ended the war in 1945, Oscar ran out of money. As a German Nazi and self-described profiteer of slave labor, Schindler must flee the oncoming Soviet Red Army. After dismissing the Nazi guards to return to their families, he packs a car in the night and bids farewell to his workers. They give him a letter explaining he's not a criminal to them, together with a ring engraved with the Talmudic quotation, he who saves the life of one man saves the world entire. Schindler is touched but deeply distraught, feeling he could have done more to save many more lives. Stern comforted the sobbing Schindler that he had done enough to save 1,100 souls. He leaves with his wife during the night, dressed in Polish prisoner clothes, posing as a refugee. The Schindler Jews, having slept outside the factory gates through the night, are awakened by sunlight for the next morning. A Soviet dragoon arrives and announces to the Jews that they have been liberated by the Red Army. The Jews walk to a nearby town in search of food. A title card informs us that Schindler was declared a righteous person by the Yad Vashem of Jerusalem and himself planted a tree on the Avenue of the Righteous in Israel, which still grows to this day. The fate of Amengoth is also shown. He was captured near the German town of Badtals and taken back to Pazo, where he is hanged for crimes against humanity. As for the surviving Schindler, Jews walk abreast. The frame changes to another of the Schindler Jews in the present day in color at the grave of Oscar Schindler in Israel. The film ends with a procession of now-aged Jews who worked in Schindler's factory, each of whom reverently sets a stone on his grave. The actors portraying the major characters walk hand-in-hand -hand with the people they portrayed, also placing stones in Schindler's grave as they pass. The audience learns that the survivors and descendants of the approximately 1,100 Jews sheltered by Schindler now number over 6,000. The Jewish population of Poland, once numbering in the millions, was at the time of the film's release approximately 4,000. In the final scene, a man places a pair of roses on the grave and stands contemplatively over it. That's all about this video. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay up to date with such interesting movie recap videos.